Hi, I am beginning with our week three of the Armor of God, the series we're calling Brave. And it's about, not just about the armor of God, but the price that Jesus paid in order for us to put on the armor of God. As we know, like every one of these pieces of the armor of God can correlate with a wound that Jesus bore on our behalf at the cross. And so we basically are able to put on what he took off on our behalf. And we're going to talk about that today. Last week, we talked about girding ourselves with the um, belt of truth. And uh, we talked about how that belt of truth goes all the way around and it covers those very most vulnerable parts. But along with that is, and we're in Ephesians 6, and Picking up in verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth around and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so we see that the, the belt of truth actually goes on first because without the truth, there is nothing to bind all of the rest of the pieces of armor together. But that belt, that breastplate of righteousness goes hand in hand with that belt of truth, which is, there's, it's no uh, coincidence that those two are melded together because they both have to do with Jesus. And we know that on the cross that we talked about last week, that he hung naked and unashamed on our behalf, he was bearing our shame. And we correlated that with the message in Isaiah 53 that proclaims that he bore our shame, that he bore our iniquities, and by his stripes that we are healed. And that is what's true about us now. Not because it's true of us and in, in our experience, but because it's true as we stand in the righteousness of Christ. And we're going to talk about that, that righteousness, that that has to be what's true about us if we truly are living as if what Jesus did for us and who we are in him is real in us and so that breastplate of righteousness becomes our covering and the breastplate as we know is what covers the heart and the lungs which if wounded are fatal um I know I'm a heart patient as well as I've had pulmonary embolism. So I've had, I know what it's like to not be able to breathe <laughs> and uh, how, how quick and how fragile this life is when we cannot take in that full breath of, in our lungs. And so that breastplate of righteousness, and doesn't it feel like um, some of the thing, times we struggle most in this life are when we just can't, we have this hard time believing that what this word says about us is true. But when there's this moment where we can just rest in this place where what the word of God says about our hearts is true and we believe it in our minds, it's like we can finally breathe. And all those that worry and that anxiousness that constantly swirls around us or around us and our fears about our lives or our loved ones or the path just ahead of us, that um we, it has to go when we finally rest in the reality that Jesus is in fact the truth about us and he is our righteousness. And that, um, that breastplate of righteousness, when we look at the heart of Christ, like what actually he died from was not the beating that he took that ripped off all of his skin from his body, it was not the nails that were pierced in his hands and in his feet. It was this, um, he died when his heart burst, when he actually died from what they believe is asphyxiation, like from um, the fluid building up so much in his lungs that it, it caused his heart to literally burst. And when we think about that, we think about, wow, his heart literally was broken because of our sin. His heart was crushed because of our sin under the weight of what all the ways and all the times that we've gone astray and that distance between our heart and the heart of God is sin. And he bore it on his own body until his heart burst 
from it. And that is actually how he died. And we know because his heart was literally pierced and blood and water came out. And that was a sign to the Romans who were experts in killing that um, he was in fact um, had already died at the time when they pierced him in the side. Um, one thing I want to talk about, that word righteousness in Hebrew is actually a word that has to do um, has to do with justice. It's a it means um, that someone is righteous because they are justified in the law. And so, if we apply this to the law of God, like if we think about like standing before God and saying, "I am justified to stand before you," um, none of us, none of us can say that. Absolutely, none of us can say that except for if we're standing in the blood of the Lamb who makes us justified. And if we put this back into Hebrew history, what would happen is um, if someone owed a debt that they could not pay, they would actually stamp it on their door. They would put the debt on that person's door and it would be like this, like um, you would have a, a something on your door that showed the amount that you owed stamped to your door. Basically saying everyone that walks by, it was very public, like they owe this debt that they cannot pay. And until they pay it, this will stay stamped there until this is reconciled somehow. And you know, we all kind of walk around like that, don't we? Like even if we don't think anyone knows we wear what we cannot pay on on our faces and our insecurities and our lives and our souls and we wear it out into the world in the way that we live but it's different when you truly believe that you are righteous in Christ not because of what you've done or because of who you are but because of who he is and what he's done on our behalf so when a debt was finally paid, they would leave that paper or whatever it was on the door of that person, yet it would be they would fold it over and say, paid in full. So that the same people who walked by and said, there's a debt that they could not pay, yet they those same people would have to walk by and see, paid in full. It is now covered. This debt has been covered. That is what righteousness means. It means there was an injustice done, yet justice, injustice, it was covered. And that is exactly what Jesus did when he went to the cross. We each owed a debt we could not pay. And he bore it through his own blood. When the Israelites were about to be delivered from um, Egyptian captivity, um, what did they do? They put the blood of a spotless lamb on the doorpost of their doors. And so that when that angel of death came by, it didn't look inside and say, well, this person's wrong, this person's right, this one's been good, but this one not so good. No, the angel of death came by and all it looked for was the blood of the lamb. And who and it passed by whoever was in that home, not because of who they were, what they had done or not done, but because of the blood of the lamb. And that blood is what justified that person before God and allowed them to live. And, and as it was with them, so it is with us. It, the blood of the lamb is what justifies us and he is our righteousness. And I just want to take a moment and ask you if you believe that, do you truly believe that he is your righteousness? And if so, that means that you are standing on the solid ground with Christ. And because you are standing not in your righteousness, but in his righteousness, then that person that's standing next to you, they are righteous as well because they are standing in the same justification that you are. And it has nothing to do with who we are, what we've done, what we haven't done, who we are not in the flesh. It has to do with nothing outside of the blood of the lamb that was slain on our behalf. And just to reiterate that, I want to go to I'm going to go to Revelation 20 where it talks about the great white throne that we're going the great white throne judgment, which is going to happen um, after um, we get to heaven. 
and I'm starting in verse 11 where it says, um, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, the earth and sky fled away and there was no place found for them. So this is when earth is um, earth and sky have fled away. So right before this, it says that all of the dead are raised. And so these are the people that have not received the blood. These are the people that said, well, I'm righteous because I believe I'm, I justify myself in this way and this and this and this, and I'm justified before men and before God. And so these are people that have said, I want to stand on my own two feet. I don't care what those Christians say. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm good because I'm good. So these, this is what will happen to them according to Revelation. This is not me saying this. This is God saying this, his word. And verse 11 says that those people are going to be raised from the dead and will stand before God to give an account of their righteousness before him. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And it's assumed these books are recording everything their whole lives lived in this earth as an earthly witness to their lives before God. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. That is the Lamb's book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So you, they will get to stand. And I mean, the people who choose to live outside of the blood of the Lamb will get to stand according to what they've done before God. So they will get their day in court, as we can say. And the sea gave up its dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. In anyone's name it was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So unfortunately, none of us has a leg to stand on before God. We are all sinners. And um, David talked about this when he was confessing his sin about um, after what happened with he and Bathsheba. This is what he said before a holy God. And this is each of our hearts. The thing about me um, being paid in full is you first have to recognize, I have an account, I cannot settle. I have something in me that is wrong before a holy God. And this is what David was saying. If we go to Psalm 51, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sins are ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment and what I always was caught on that like well David sinned against like he had Bathsheba's husband killed like he sinned more than against God but you know it's he saying that against you and you only have I sinned because at the heart, at the root of all of it, all of the evil, hateful, mean things we do to other people and to ourselves and all the ways that we justify what we do to other people in ourselves is a sin against a holy God. It all stems from the same source, which is us living outside of this abiding place and all holy God who made us right with him and who gave us a right place to stand in him and who gave us a righteousness to stand before him so that all of it points he's pointing to the root of it which is against God a holy God I have this iniquity in me and I have nothing no place to put it outside of you God but I'm coming to you God for mercy and asking for you to be for mercy to um, look upon me because in you only are the one that can truly judge me, judge me righteously because you're the only one that can fix what's really, really wrong with me, which is my own heart. My own heart is what's really, really wrong with me. And for all of us that come to know our saving knowledge of Jesus, to understand that we have an account we cannot pay, that 
is what it boils down to. I recognize there's something wrong in me and what's wrong in me is my sin against you, God. As David goes on to say, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth and the inward being. What God delights is that moment where the light bulb clicks on and you're saying, oh my goodness, I am a sinner. I really do need God. It doesn't mean you have to be right and you have to be a good person and learn how to be a, a Bible beater. Like that, no, it's a recognition that in my innermost being, something is really, really wrong with me. And yet Jesus is here saying, can I have that heart? And I will put it in my heart and I will give you my own heart inside of you and you will be right with me and I will teach you and I will lead you for the rest of your life and you will find freedom and wholeness in me and in my relationship with you. And when you fall down, you could call on me and I'll help you get up and I will faithfully walk with you all the way home to heaven and you will be justified before me because you have given me this moment of you've given me faith that the, in the reality of what I've done on your behalf, that I bore it, that I paid for it and that it is paid in full by my precious blood that was shed for you. And that is what it means to wear that breastplate of righteousness. I know there's some days where I get up and I try to be good and I can't. And the Lord's like, you can't try to be good, Rhonda. You can just stand in what I've done for you and have fellowship with me and really, really, really trust that I've got you and that I'm going to carry you all the way home. And he does. Every time I try to stand up on my own two feet and try to be good, I can't do it. And I fail miserably. And I have to humbly admit, Lord, I cannot do it. He says, I know. That's why I came for you. But if you get up in humility and you admit what's wrong and you let me shine the light of my love upon that, we will just keep going forward again and again and again. You're never going to grow out of your need for me, Rhonda, because you're going to need me the whole way home. You're going to need my righteous justification of your life the whole way home. And you're never going to grow out of this need for my blood that was spilled on your behalf. And oh, how I want to. I'm going to share one last testimony. It's, it's pretty humbling to admit this, but um, there was a time in my life where the Lord was really teaching me about this, and it was in my marriage. And um, I was learning at the time about David and um, his friend, that this really close friendship he had with King Saul's son, Jonathan. And, and I was reading about the time where... Um, David and Jonathan were very close friends, but Saul was wanting to kill David and, and Jonathan didn't quite believe him, but, um, he and David made this pact and David was like, I mean, Jonathan was like, Hey, I'm going to go sit at this table with my dad. And if, and I tell, when he asks if why you're not there, if he responds this way, then I'm going to know like, wow, he really does want to kill you and I will come and meet you. And that's exactly what happened is, is, um, Jonathan's eyes were open and he was like, Whoa, my dad is pretty far off. Like he really does want to kill David. And so it's not safe for David to hang around here any longer. So I better send him away and warn him about uh, my father's plans for him. And so that's what happens. And so they go off and they meet in this field. And here's Jonathan, which is literally the, a prince. Like he's the king's son. And um, David, this shepherd boy out in the field. And um, oh, still makes me cry when I think about it. And um, so David... Uh, Jonathan says, take off your, uh, let's trade clothes because Jonathan being the prince had armor to wear and David, you know, and, um, uh, you know, he, what did Jonathan put on? But David, he had to probably put on David's clothes, which were probably stinky shepherd's clothes. <laughs> and, um, the reason this sticks out in me is because I remember the Lord met me while I was reading that story about these two close friends. It says that about Jonathan, that he loved David as himself. He loved David as himself to where he thought, I want for David what I would want for myself. I want for my brother what I want for me, which is just a 
blessings, a fruitful life, to go and be married and have kids and be blessed and enter his kingship and enter the plans God has for him. And you know what the Lord showed me was that about my own marriage, he was like, Rhonda, you do not love your husband as yourself. You walk around here in your kingly garments and are like, ooh, isn't my robe beautiful? Isn't my armor shiny? But when you love someone as yourself, you actually take them under your robe. Or you take off your armor and put that on them so they are protected. That is what it looks like to love someone as yourself. And it broke my heart because I knew it was true. I knew in my heart, even though I thought I was righteous with God, but my own judgment of someone else, especially my own husband, was showing my, that I really wasn't standing in the righteousness of Christ. Because the righteousness of Christ and his justification is never disconnected from his love for us and for others said, you will love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others as you love yourself. And one of the things, and I guess the, one of the things that breaks my heart uh, about a lot of us in the church today and in Christ, the bride of Christ, is I haven't quite seen that yet, where we're willing to take others under our garment and cover them. This covering of Christ is a big deal. God left heaven, died on the cross to offer us his covering. And we, in love and fellowship, ought to cover others and even give and then cover them with our armor and protection. And instead, I see people using the sword to fight against each other. You're, I'm right, you're wrong. And the righteousness of Christ is none of that. It's standing in the fellowship with Christ and oneness with him and complete humility knowing the only reason we have any right standing before God is because of the blood that we're standing in his blood not our own his blood the blood of the lamb and that our only protection is his own covering of us we don't have to cover ourselves when we're covered by the lamb and in him we have every opportunity to be brave for he is a sure covering for us. And so I just want to pray this for us today, that we are able to stand in this righteousness of Christ, knowing that we are justified in him. Father, thank you for coming for us, becoming our righteousness, so that we have the breastplate of righteousness to cover over our hearts, in and of ourselves, we have no righteousness of our own. Our hearts are wicked, deceitful above all things, and our minds and our just lead our hearts and our minds lead us into places and into thoughts and into intentions that we have no business being. But Lord, I pray that right now we will come into this alignment with you, unto your covering, into the righteousness of Christ, and stand by faith in the justification in Christ knowing that you have covered us and your covering is um, trustworthy and it will not allow us to be uh, victims, Lord, of, our, of each other, of ourselves, or of the enemy, Lord. And I ask for forgiveness, uh, both on my behalf and on behalf of anyone else who these, hears these words for all the times that we've tried to stand in our righteousness which is really self-righteousness, not your righteousness, and tried to use our armor as weapons and shields against our hearts instead of covering for another's heart. I pray that you help us as a church just be repentant and, um, and be more diligent to see others in your righteousness as a person whom you went to the cross for, whom you love and whom you long to bring under your covering. And I pray that you help us do a good job of this, Lord. And I ask you to forgive us for all the times we haven't. We thank you and we love you. We thank you for the armor of God and we thank you for the cross which made it possible for us to be able to wear. We ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name and we thank you for being our righteousness paid in full by your precious blood, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for letting me share my heart with you today. God bless you. And I love you.